You know what fascinates me about the Tiger II? It wasn't just heavy. It was catastrophically, hilariously, tragically heavy. We're talking about a tank that weighed more than a fully loaded railroad car. 70 tons. That's not a typo. 70. Tons. Most modern main battle tanks barely crack 60, and they have 70 years of engineering advancement on their side. But here's the kicker. The Germans knew it was too heavy. They built it anyway. I've spent way too much time thinking about this, to be honest. Maybe it's because the Tiger II represents everything wrong with late war German thinking. Maybe it's because I can't wrap my head around the engineering meetings where someone said, you know what this 70 ton tank needs, more armor. Or maybe, just maybe, it's because the Tiger II is the perfect example of how winning battles doesn't mean winning wars. So let's talk about weight, not just numbers on a spec sheet, but what weight actually means when you're trying to fight a war. Because turns out, when your super tank can't cross most bridges, gets stuck in mud that wouldn't slow down a Sherman, and drinks fuel like a fraternity pledge at spring break, you don't have a weapon. You have a very expensive, very deadly lawn ornament. The year is 1942. The Wehrmacht is getting its teeth kicked in by Soviet T-34s and KV-1s. German tank crews are discovering that their Panzer III's and IV's might as well be throwing spitballs at Russian armor. Panic sets in at the highest levels. Hitler, never one for subtlety, demands bigger tanks, more armor, bigger guns. The Tiger I enters production, and it's impressive. 56 tons of screw you to anything in its path. But that wasn't enough. Oh no, because if 56 tons is good, 70 must be better, right? I mean, come on. This is the same logic that leads to ordering a large pizza for yourself because the medium just seems inadequate. Except instead of heartburn, you get a logistics nightmare that would make Amazon's supply chain weep. The Tiger II, or King Tiger, as the Allies called it, was born from this more is more philosophy. And on paper, dear God, it looked unstoppable. The frontal armor was 150 millimeter thick. That's nearly six inches of hardened steel, sloped at 50 degrees, giving it an effective thickness that would make a battleship jealous. The gun, an 80 millimeter KWK 43L71. Basically, they took the legendary 80 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, made it longer, meaner, and said, yeah, Let's put this on tracks. Here's where things get interesting. The Tiger II could penetrate any Allied tank at ranges exceeding 2,000 meters. The Allies couldn't penetrate the Tiger II's front armor at any range with their standard tanks. Sounds great, right? Unbeatable even. Well, not quite. Because as it turns out, wars aren't won by specifications. They're won by logistics, mobility, and the ability to actually get your wonder weapon to the battlefield without it breaking down getting stuck or running out of fuel. Let me paint you a picture. It's late 1944. You're a Tiger II commander. Your tank is a masterpiece of engineering, when it works. The transmission, borrowed from the lighter Tiger Y, is screaming under the strain. Your final drive, the component that transfers power to the tracks, has a life expectancy measured in hundreds of kilometers. Not thousands, hundreds. Your fuel consumption is so astronomical that you need a dedicated supply convoy just to keep moving. And that's assuming you can find roads and bridges that can support your weight. Most bridges in Europe were rated for maybe 30 tons. The Tiger II laughed at such numbers, or it would have if tanks could laugh. Instead, it collapsed them. Combat engineers had to reinforce bridges before the Tiger II could cross. Imagine that, you're trying to fight a mobile war and you have to stop and basically rebuild infrastructure just to move your tanks. It's like trying to race Formula One cars through a neighborhood where you have to repave the street as you go. But wait, there's more. The ground pressure of the Tiger II was actually higher than many lighter tanks. Why? Because while the tracks were wider than standard tanks, they weren't wide enough to properly distribute 70 tons. This meant that in anything resembling soft ground, mud, snow, wet fields, the Tiger II would sink. And when a 70-ton tank sinks, it doesn't just get stuck. It becomes a bunker, an immobile, fuel-hungry bunker. There's this famous account from the Ardennes Offensive. A Tiger II battalion is advancing through Belgium. 
they encounter a muddy field that Sherman's had crossed hours earlier without issue. The first Tiger II attempts to cross. It sinks to its hull. The second tries to go around, also stuck. Within an hour, half the battalion is mired in mud that medium tanks treated like a minor inconvenience. The crew eventually had to abandon several of them. 70 tons of advanced engineering, defeated by dirt and water. The mechanical reliability was its own special nightmare. The Tiger II used the same Maybach HL230 engine as the Tiger I and Panther. Now this engine produced about 700 horsepower. Sounds decent, right? Except the Panther weighed 45 tons. The Tiger I weighed 56 tons. The Tiger II, 70 tons. You're asking the same engine to move 25% more weight. It's like putting a Honda Civic engine in a pickup truck and wondering why it keeps breaking down. Final drives were the real Achilles heel though. These components took all the engine's power and transferred it to the tracks. In the Tiger II, they were under constant, brutal stress. The official manual recommended replacing them every 500 kilometers. In practice, they often failed after 150. Some units reported final drive failures after less than 100 kilometers. Imagine driving a car where the transmission needs replacing every thousand miles. That's what Tiger II crews dealt with, except their car was in a war zone. And speaking of war, let's talk about combat effectiveness. Yes, the Tiger II was nearly invulnerable from the front. Yes, it could destroy any Allied tank at extreme ranges. But here's the thing about tank warfare. It's not a duel at high noon. It's about mobility, combined arms, and most importantly, numbers. A Sherman tank weighed 30 tons. America built over 49,000 of them. They were reliable, easy to maintain, and could use basically any bridge or road in Europe. Their 75mm guns couldn't penetrate a Tiger II's front armor, true. But they could flank it, they could call in air support, they could overwhelm it with numbers, and most importantly, they could actually get to the battle. The Tiger II. Germany built less than 500. Total. Ever. And at any given time, maybe half were operational. The rest were waiting for parts, broken down, or stuck somewhere. It's the ultimate example of quality versus quantity except the quality came with so many drawbacks that the quantity became irrelevant. Fuel consumption was another killer. The Tiger II got about 0.5 miles per gallon on roads. Off-road? Forget about it. You might as well measure it in gallons per mile. In late 1944 and 1945, when Germany was desperately short on fuel, having tanks that drank gasoline like it was going out of style was not ideal. There are numerous accounts of Tiger II's being abandoned simply because there was no fuel to move them. Training was another issue nobody talks about. Driving a Tiger II required serious skill. The transmission was notoriously difficult to operate. The steering system, which used hydraulic power that varied with engine speed, took extensive practice to master. New drivers would burn out transmissions in days. Experienced Panzer IV drivers would get into a Tiger II and immediately break something. It's like going from driving a Ford Focus to piloting a space shuttle. Sure, they're both vehicles, but that's where the similarities end. The tactical inflexibility was perhaps the most damaging aspect, though. The Tiger II was designed for one thing, long-range tank duels on open terrain. In that specific scenario, it was unmatched. But how often does war give you exactly what you want? In urban combat, the Tiger II was a liability, too big to maneuver, too heavy for building floors, too thirsty to operate for extended periods. In forests, its long gun would get caught on trees. In mountains, its weight made many roads impassable. Compare this to the Sherman or T-34. Were they inferior in a straight fight? Absolutely. But they could go anywhere, fight in any terrain, and most importantly, they could be there when needed. A Sherman might not win against a Tiger II, but 10 Shermans could be in 10 different places while one Tiger II was stuck at a river crossing, waiting for engineers to reinforce the bridge. There's this persistent myth that the Tiger II was undefeated in tank-on-tank -tank combat. It's mostly true, but it misses the point entirely. It's like saying a fortress is undefeated. Sure, if you can't move and the enemy has to come to you, you'll probably win. But wars aren't won by sitting still. The production costs were staggering too. One Tiger II cost as much as four Panthers or six Panzer IVs. 
For that same price, you could build 21 Stugs. 21. And Stugs were excellent tank destroyers that could hide, shoot, and scoot. They were everything the Tiger II wasn't. Practical, reliable, and numerous. Let me tell you about Koenigstiger unit readiness rates, because they're hilarious in the most tragic way possible. In March 1945, Schwer Panzer Abteilung 506 reported 16 Tiger II's operational out of 45. That's barely one-third. The rest were down for maintenance, waiting for parts, or simply broken beyond immediate repair. This wasn't unusual. This was normal. Meanwhile, American armored units regularly maintained 80-90% readiness rates with their Shermans. Soviet T-34 units, despite their reputation for crude engineering, kept similar numbers. Because it turns out, a simple, reliable tank that works is infinitely more valuable than a complex super tank that doesn't. The Tiger II's combat debut in Normandy was telling. During Operation Goodwood in July 1944, Tiger the Sioux of Schwer Panzerabteilung 503 inflicted heavy losses on British armor. One Tiger II reportedly destroyed 14 Shermans. Impressive, right? Except that same unit lost most of its Tiger IIs to mechanical failure during the subsequent retreat. They literally had to blow up their own tanks because they couldn't move them. Here's what really gets me. German engineers weren't stupid. They knew about these problems. Test reports from 1943 highlighted every single issue I've mentioned. Weight problems, documented, reliability concerns, extensively noted, fuel consumption, calculated down to the liter, but they built it anyway. Why? Because Hitler loved big tanks, and in Nazi Germany, what Hitler wanted, Hitler got, even if it made no tactical sense whatsoever. The Allies developed specific tactics for dealing with Tiger IIs that basically boiled down to avoid the front and exploit literally every other weakness. They'd use artillery to separate Tiger IIs from their infantry support. Fighter bombers would attack supply convoys, knowing that a Tiger II without fuel was just an expensive pillbox. Tank units were instructed to flank or bypass, never engage head-on, unless absolutely necessary. One British tank commander described fighting Tiger the Sims as like fighting a heavyweight boxer with bad knees and asthma. Dangerous if he hits you, but easy to dance around. By early 1945, the situation was farcical. Tiger II units would receive replacement vehicles, but no spare parts. Crews would cannibalize broken tanks to keep others running. Some units had more mechanics than combat crew. There are reports of Tiger IIs being used as static defense positions, not by choice, but because they literally couldn't move. The final drive situation got so bad that units developed elaborate preventive maintenance schedules. Drive for two hours, rest for one. Never exceed 15 mile march. Avoid sharp turns. It's like owning a supercar that you can only drive to church on Sundays. What's the point? You want to know the real tragedy. The resources spent on Tiger II production could have made a difference elsewhere. Those high quality materials, skilled workers, and production hours could have built hundreds of Panthers, thousands of Stugs, or even better, trucks and half-tracks that the Wehrmacht desperately needed. Instead, Germany built fewer than 500 Tiger IIs, of which maybe 150 saw significant combat. The rest were lost to mechanical failure, lack of fuel, or simply abandoned during retreats. It's the ultimate example of winning the engineering battle while losing the logistics war. Modern tank design learned from the Tiger II's failures. Today's main battle tanks are heavy, sure, but they're designed with mobility and reliability as primary concerns. The M1 Abrams weighs about 68 tons, similar to a Tiger II, but it can cruise at 45 millipiates on roads and maintain that speed for hours. Its gas turbine engine is thirsty, but reliable. Most importantly, it's designed to be maintained in the field by regular crews, not require a master mechanic and a prayer. The Soviets, perhaps learning the best lesson, went the opposite direction post-war. Their tanks emphasized simplicity, reliability, and mass production. A T-54 might not match Western tanks in raw capability, but it could be built in enormous numbers and operated by conscripts with minimal training. Guess which philosophy proved more practical during the Cold War? I sometimes wonder what would have happened if Germany had skipped the Tiger II entirely. Imagine those resources going to Panther production. The Panther, 
for all its early faults, evolved into a reliable, powerful medium tank by 1944. It could fight, it could move, and most importantly, it could be built in meaningful numbers. A thousand extra Panthers might have actually made a difference. 500 Tiger IIs, they're footnotes. But that's not how it worked out. The Tiger II remains this fascinating example of engineering excellence married to strategic stupidity. It's the tank equivalent of bringing a sword to a gunfight. If the sword is made of solid gold, encrusted with diamonds, and so heavy, you can barely lift it. The last Tiger IIs were destroyed or captured in April and May 1945. Some were found abandoned at rail stations, out of fuel. Others were discovered in repair depots, waiting for parts that would never come. A few made last stands, immobile but still dangerous, until bypassed or destroyed by artillery. It was an ignominious end for what was supposed to be the ultimate tank. There's one Tiger II at the Bovington Tank Museum that still runs. Watching it move is impressive and slightly sad. It's like watching the last dinosaur, magnificent, powerful, and completely unsuited for the modern world. The ground shakes when it passes, the engine screams under the load, and you can't help but think, all that engineering brilliance wasted on a fundamentally flawed concept. What's the lesson here? That bigger isn't always better, that logistics beats tactics, that practical beats perfect? All true, but I think it goes deeper. The Tiger II represents what happens when ego overrides logic, when the desire to build the best blinds you to what's actually needed. In war, the best tank isn't the one with the thickest armor or biggest gun. It's the one that shows up, the one that crosses the bridge, the one that doesn't break down, the one you can build a thousand of while your enemy builds a hundred. The Tiger II failed on all these counts. It wasn't a weapon. It was a statement, a 70-ton statement that said, we can build the biggest, baddest tank in the world. And they could. They did. It just turned out that building the world's heaviest tank is like building the world's tallest house of cards. Impressive, but ultimately useless when the wind starts blowing. Maybe that's the real tragedy of the Tiger II. Not that it was too heavy, but that brilliant engineer spent years perfecting a weapon for a war that didn't exist. They built a tank for set-piece battles on perfect terrain with unlimited logistics. They built a tank for winning battles when they needed a tank for winning wars. So yeah, the Tiger II was too heavy to be a real weapon. But more than that, it was too perfect for its own good. Too specialized, too demanding, too everything except what was actually needed, which was something that worked. History's full of similar examples, but few are as literal as 70 tons of steel and broken dreams, stuck in Belgian mud, waiting for fuel that would never come. Sometimes I think about those final drive gears, grinding themselves to dust under impossible loads. It's almost poetic. The Tiger II, the king of tanks, ultimately destroyed by its own weight, defeated not by enemy shells, but by physics and the immutable laws of mechanical stress. That's probably not what Hitler had in mind when he demanded bigger tanks. But physics doesn't care about your ideology. Bridges don't care about your engineering prowess. And mud definitely doesn't care about your war plans. The Tiger II learned those lessons the hard way, one broken final drive at a time. And that, more than any penetration table or armor thickness, is why it was too heavy to be a real weapon. The 70 tons of the Tiger II weren't just weight. They were hubris, cast in steel, and measured in failure. Every extra ton of armor was another bridge that couldn't be crossed, another mile that couldn't be traveled, another mechanical component stressed beyond its limits. The Tiger II wasn't defeated by allied tanks. It was defeated by gravity, and gravity always wins.